try. Okay, so hello, hello. Um, I am here with Robert Ryan, and um, I wanted to um, have a little conversation with you, Robert, to address this uh, kaboom of a Facebook post that I made, and um, and kind of address what the underpinnings are because it was a little tiny post with only whatever 12 words or something and um there's a lot to unpack <laughs> there's a lot there and and in my thinking a lot of that unpacking was pretty obvious it was kind of old news it was not something i thought was particularly fresh it certainly isn't the most bold facebook post i've ever made um made one last week about how you can't build communities i thought that was far more controversial actually um but this one hit a nerve and um and 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 to be fair it it started with a nerve that was hit in me and so my um i think you can you know feel the emotional passion in the post which basically says that stage theory is BS and it always was, and it's colonial as hell. Mm -hmm. Why did I say such a thing? Um, and for me, this was a, you know, a, 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 a cry for a, a kind of ceasing to violence, the mm -hmm. violence of measuring, labeling, evaluating, and, and, and basically putting other human beings on the Procrustean bed of this thing called development. Procrustes was this guy, you know, who guarded the gates of Athens. And if people didn't fit, he, he, he measured them by putting them on this iron bed. And if they didn't fit, they were stretched or trimmed or tucked, or they were somehow mm -hmm. made to fit. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's about this fitting. And, and you know what? The thing is that uh, you and I have already spoken about this. Uh, Traditional societies had, you know, rites of passage and rituals and uh, various different activities that you would do to to join some sort of role for the tribe or to do things. But that's not the same thing. It's not the same kind of uh, rich, meaningful, complex uh, relationship that, that, that you would have in those sort of settings that basically we're talking about is a very sort of uh, ideas before people perspective where you're saying, here's this idea a beautiful idea forget people for a moment i'm i'm in my philosopher's chair and i have this beautiful idea of of wouldn't it be great if humans worked like this because then we would know how to manage them they would be like a me mechanical thing that would fit and then it would say this goes in this box that goes in. wouldn't that be lovely and some people just fall in love with the beauty of of well that would create security it would create control it would create um uh, a lack of uncertainty. It would, it would diminish uncertainty. It would increase our productivity because everything would have a place for it itself. Isn't that a beautiful idea? And that's where a lot of this stage three stuff came from. And it also came from, as you and I discussed uh, prior, the, um, the growth of the factory and, and um, uh, industrial revolution and capitalism and this championing of the ordinary person and the ordinary worker as being the center of society, um, politically, we would basically say, um, you know, the laborer, you know, not the elite person, not the, but also not the special person, not the unique person, not the person with unique talents and abilities, the person who's just like everyone else, but fits in and works hard. And if you overperform or underperform, that was considered to be a bad thing back then, you know? It, it, yeah, and it was it was everywhere, right? It was yeah. not just about um, studying child development. It was about studying hereditary traits so that you could breed better people, right? It was With human the idea. resources. It was hereditism. It was statistics. Uh, it was even uh, you could even look at it in terms of Freemasonry in the thirty three levels, you know, basically. And that actually became the foundation for the Nazi system of uh, rank, which also had exactly 33 levels and had levels that were directly barred from Freemasonry in theory. And the idea was that, you know, you level up and you, you get your fair rewards as a, as a member of the Nazi party, you know, and at each level, you would be asked to do something 
ickier and your rewards would be greater. And that would be the more the moral uh, system that they promoted. <laughs> you know? and, and so what yeah. I perceive as having yeah. happened is that there was this, you know, prior to industrialism, there's always been hierarchy, like you said, always. right? Passage, et cetera. And, and that these pre-existing experiences of hierarchy were more cosmological. Yeah, and, yes. and that, okay, that had issues as well because a lot of hierarchy in those cosmologies had to do with slavery and so on. But this new version was about industrial efficiency. It was about mm-hmm. speed and efficiency and productivity and high yield. And all the things we know of to, that, that, that these things have not stopped since then. Right. And so look, there are it, benefits it, and drawbacks. And right. the benefits were extreme uh, scalability of the food culture and medicine. And uh, death rates fell dramatically and infant mortality fell and quality of life seemed to go up in so many other ways. But uh, also anxiety went through the roof. <laughs> And so psychological wellness has become probably a bigger problem now than the survival needs. Uh, and and it's, there's a direct connection. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a direct connection. And so this, the old hierarchy pr- provided right. the perfect soil mm-hmm. for people to actually be familiar already with this new version of hierarchy. It didn't feel new. And, and the factory began to define the society and the society was the factory and the education system became modeled within the factory, became modeled with it, right? And so things from politics to education, to economics, to religion, of course, and so on. And in the heart of this, there is eugenics coming. Uh, eugenics and Gaussian statistics, those two things like this, and, you know, we don't have time to hit on it in this quick video, but we'll talk about in the future. Uh, there is a literal truth between the connection between colonialism, eugenics, the development of formal social science during that period, um, like especially 1850 to 19, 1840 to 1940. Um, a very rich history about those interconnections and very much there was this idea of the normal person as the best person that the further you went away from the from the general mean the most normal mean or the average of averages the that the less healthy someone would be the, the idea is that even a genius someone with some special talent would be defective in some way. Well, well, they're a nerd. They're physically frail. They're less physically attractive. They, they're annoying. They have social deficits. Uh, and that's the price they pay for being smarter. And this was, you know, so in the 1850s through 1880s, there was this obsession with the, the folk or the Volk, or which in German, in Germany, France, even in England and the United States, where the good people were the ones who got the best labor jobs. They were in the United States, Henry Ford, and the idea was uh, he tried to do a lot of good things for people, but he also did a lot of creepy things, such as basically promoting the image of the perfect factory worker as this beautiful, powerful, robust, hardworking man, probably about 6'2 to 6'4, kicks ass, goes home, drinks beer. He, pr- he listens to folk music, which was promoted by Henry Ford. You had to listen to the right music when you went home. You had a human resources system, which measured your personal development. It measured whether or not you were doing good parenting at home. Um, you know, this was all part of Fordism, that the social services that you would have at home were based on your normality and how weird you were and whether or not you were acting like a normal, healthy, you know, ideal factory worker. And if you didn't fit that mold, you were a problem, better or worse, left or it didn't matter. Uh, just all that matters is that you didn't fit. So then we start to get this seemingly mm-hmm. objective version of what is normalcy and how to measure it. That's right. Right. And so, and, and with that comes, of course, eugenics starts and and you know, at this point, we're 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 moving across the birth the of the American century. Psychological Association. G. G. Stanley Hall, who was a rabid eugenicist, 
I mean, he was not shy. He started most of the American eugenics organizations or was a president or advising member to them. And he was the president of the APA at the same time. Talk about conflict of interest. <laughs> and he just, you know, he ranked races, he ranked personalities, he ranked everything. Everything was better or worse. And he had some Victorian age morality that he put into that as well, where, you know, masturbation was bad and all that. <laughs> and so, like, and so you have Hall and then you have uh, uh, Terman and you have a whole series of other folks who react to this and say, well, you know, what is normal? And they competed to create various different models to measure people. And a lot of them were testing these models with the U.S. military in the recruiting system. IQ was developed that way. Exactly. And so we have this rich history and you can read the mismeasure of man and uh, Stephen Jay Gould is a great source for, for that. But we have this rich history of mismeasuring man, you know, as, as, as Gould called it. Um, um, and of and women weren't even being measured <laughs> and that was that was the scary part i mean we women met, people yeah. of other cultures so you know what's happening here women. is that all sorts of other ways of being other ways of knowing right. are essentially being steamrolled yeah. by those things that can be made more efficient right. and um and, and as they become more efficient we are working with new forms of math mathematics and statistics to measure efficiency and to optimize okay this is optimizing right. everything optimizing needs logic to be, yeah everything needs to be bettering and right. and and so you you know you start to get that in your personal life you should be a better person this year than you were last year and right. and of course this is also tying into old old epistemologies of morality and 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 being a citizen and so it's all there very it's militaristic getting... it's like classic rome as i was discussing with you where basically like uh, it was really the the birth of those kinds of measurements and the births of eugenics was the birth of the uh professional warrior the idea that you know i'm going to hire you and I'm going to measure you and train you to fit you with in, into the legion. And you're going to be just like Henry Ford. You're going to be this, you know, the ideal ass kicking ordinary person. You know, if your IQ is too high, that's a problem. If your personality is too quirky, it's a problem. I need you to fit in the box. And the benefit of this, just like with the Nazis is I'm going to give you spoils of war and I'm going to give you, I'm going to look the other way morally. I'm going to allow rape. I'm going to allow prostitution. I'm going to allow, uh, alcoholism, we're going to allow all these bad behaviors because of what you did for the state. And everybody else who is suffering underneath that hierarchy uh, deserves it because that, that was the Roman form of triage. How do we decide who eats first? How do we decide who lives or dies? It was the person who was willing to commit the most sins to fit into the most boxes. Mm. <laughs> That's horrifying. I mean, and then I guess what, what really starts to come out in the, the post is about stage right. theory, in, in which I'm right. absolutely referring to Piaget. Okay, and Piaget right. is, he was, he, you know, he probably, he wasn't a bad guy. It wasn't mm -hmm. his fault. It, you know, actually. Compared it, to the other stages, he was the nice one. I, my dad liked him, knew him and liked yeah. him. Um, but but the the issue as a person, he liked him. So he was doing research in the way that he could do research on a question mm -hmm. that was already shaped. Okay, so the, the whole right. conversation that we've had so far is about the shaping of the question that Piaget was asking. Right. And how that shape came to be and why that shape had an existing ecology of ideas to fit into. That's right? right. That's what's important to me here is is not it's not really about the stage theory it's about the world that creates it and the world in which it makes sense and it gets reproduced and, so, and, yeah and it should be common knowledge to people now that you know in the educational system we say learners are diverse you know we should have diverse forms of learning we should have we should take into consideration people's learning um disabilities sometimes as superpowers okay mm -hmm. and so the autistic person also has autistic superpowers not just uh social deficiencies the add person tends to be uh more likely to be socially bon vivant and and to be funny like a lot of the funniest people are add and and th these things they're not it's not just simply a defection and so um so we're getting there like this is where we this is the conversation we're having right now in education and in development so let's not we're not saying that people 
we're surprised anyone would would deny what we were saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah but 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 yeah we definitely are doing good work these mm -hmm. days but we still are trying to do retrograde motion fixing of old models by saying let's 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 tweak stage theories let's tweak integral perspectives and let's tweak hierarchical perspectives so that we're just creating one after another after another auxiliary service to support special cases. So like at the university, um, we've got uh, the writing lab and then the learning lab and then the, uh, the, the autism lab and then the, uh, the psychology help. And so basically we now have more special case help organizations on campus than we do ordinary activities. We have more than two times the number of support people for every faculty uh, in terms of making exceptions to the rule. Mm -hmm. And if we're getting this constant bureaucratization of, addition, of more and more and more ways to, to fix stage theory, to fix ordinary developmental processes with these special add-ons, that's retrograde motion analysis. It's just like when we're trying to rescue the the helio, um, oh, sorry, the euro, the eurocentric theory, uh, uh, um, the, um, a, a, um, and try to create a model where the cosmos goes around the Earth. And what we're doing right now is we're trying to create these complex retrograde motion analyses to make normalcy work. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so we've got this massively exploding eco ecosystem, all protecting that kernel of normalcy. And it's deep. This is the problem is that somewhere deep, right. and this is, this is the, the nerve that I think I hit is that there right. is this deep assumption that yes, there must be an arc of measurable human development. Right. And we must, but that must be true. And can't we just use that on, on, on evolution? And can't we use it on human development and can't we use it on all kinds of things, spirituality. Um, and the question that, that I wanted to really pose here is why? Like mm -hmm. really, given where this comes from, are you sure you want this ghost in your, in your work? Right. Because it's lurking. And the, the way that it lurks is, is invisible and dangerous. And one of the ways that we start to see this is in these, um, you know, really well-meaning notions of we need to create a scalable Utopia. mind shift to to change the ecology and the way people are living in the ecology. And and here's the master codes for that. <laughs> right. And and the thing is, is that the ecological these frameworks too are laced with eugenics. I mean, right. Hardin from the beginning of the tragedy of the commons, Hardin was a card carrying eugenicist. The questions he was asking were eugenics questions. Who do we right. save and who do we not save? Right. And so basically when we go back to this question of triage, you know, uh, one eugenics approach for triage is, is like I said, you give the spoils to, to the military. That's if you're in a paradigm where you're in an imperialistic society and you fight war as your primary dire directive. Now, if we fight environmental problems as our primary directive, who gets the spoils first? Mm -hmm. And it becomes the new elite of, of the environmental vanguard. And then those people become the special people and they basically get to set the, set the norms. Now they will tell you, just like, just like the Roman soldier does, they're fighting for every citizen of Rome, every citizen of Rome. That's exactly how they were able to justify that is to say, well, you know, I may get the spoils, but I'm also fighting for everyone. But the way that the eco ecological elite are doing it is they're doing it through cognitive spoils. It's not, it's not, we're going to be richer than you. We're the beautiful people. We're cognitively better than you, you know? Well, and that's what sneaks in <laughs> as stage theory. It sneaks in, yes. with the, are you level five? Are you level five, turquoise? Yeah. Are you, you know, whatever the thing is. And there's, there's a whole lot of them. So there's, it's not really about any particular any version of it. It's this idea that there is some objective 
triangulation possible through which to measure the 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 normal progress human, from normal to to superior <laughs> and and the yeah. thing is is that human beings like every other organism and any kind of ecological living system are shifting and learning in multiple contexts simultaneously and if you have a a measuring stick you're only going to see one context and so the fix it for that is not to try to create a measurement that holds more context mm -hmm. the fix it for that is to let go of the measurement and to start to work on a different kind of perception that's able to because we are able to okay children do it at a very early age they're able i mean actually the whole stage theory should be flipped as as my friend steve nakmanovich says it's the kids that can actually do the complexity theory. <laughs> i've said this myself so one of the ironies was that in maslow's hierarchy of needs he would always put like these these great uh lofty ideas high talk to a five-year-old and tell them about the ridiculous behaviors of adults and be like everybody can be friends we can all love each other <laughs> like talk to a five-year-old they'll sound much more enlightened than the average 25 year old and that's because that basically they have to unlearn that that perspective as they face various different hardships and struggles for scarcity and for promotion and for you know we're being funneled into a very you know uh uh, you know, the meat grinder of society and, and you know, children are, are have not yet been tainted by that meat grinder. And so uh, the interesting thing here is like uh, people say, well, 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 you're just throwing out critiques. You know, I, I, I really deplore crit a critique only perspective. It's really tiresome. It's just throwing tomatoes, you know. So we're not here to throw tomatoes at psychology, I don't think at all. I think what we're here to do is to point out basically where we need to pivot in our thinking and specifically like, so what you said is the problem being measurement. My problem is when you have this beautiful idea that I came up with, my armchair idea, wouldn't it be nice if things were like this? Wouldn't it be nice if the human race or humanity or whatever you want to call it worked in such a fashion because my mind would then know how to accept and control that. I would feel secure. I would know up from down, left from right. It's like Iliada's perspective of like the axis mundi, you know, mm -hmm. I would know the center of the world and I would know where I was in relation to it. Isn't that lovely? But the thing is that if you choose scientific models of personal growth, learning, development, or quasi-science uh, as your new religion, then basically you love the idea more than people. And what you're trying to do is fix people by getting them to be more like the idea. Mm. And, and whereas what we're really talking about is people, people first, not ideas. And that means I want a society built of individuals and I want a society built where we are primarily concerned with getting to know each other first, people before philosophy. And I've had this argument recently on philosophy boards where they keep arguing philosophy before people. And I'm saying, you know, you are trying to tell me that if I don't buy into this philosophical system, fit. I'm inferior. Right. I don't fit. Right. And so that's, I think, my, my, I think, approach is that there is a kind of rewilding of, mm -hmm. of our relationships, our relation, our, our interior world, the mm -hmm. premises of our, of our ideas. So my person my, to person, especially person to person, and even within yourself, um, you know, this, this notion of just what are the premises that I'm mm. arriving at this from? And to do that means kind of getting out of a matrix, right? Who We're am I without matrix. politics? Who am I without politics? And, Who am I? <laughs> and, and paying attention, like this, this kind of thing about the stage theory idea, the thing that is most pernicious about it is the way that it can actually be repackaged and resold and that the the cultural landscape is still a fertile ground for it and it will flourish in new ways but they're still containing the old seeds so my 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 question then and hope is that can we pay attention to this and and start to let the weird and the wild and the abnormal and the thought that doesn't fit in the model start to have some air. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And and so that's, I mean, obviously I didn't mean to, you know, drive everybody crazy. I, I just meant to say, I, I really care about the violence that, right. that this stage theory and the history of it has produced. And there are ways around it that don't involve just calling everything willy nilly. And I think one of the reactions that you got is, oh my goodness, she said, she's going to decolonialize us. So she's going to use a particular kind of critical theory from a particular kind of perspective. And it, that's, that's her answer. And that's not at all what you were saying, first of all. And you were saying acknowledge, like there's, one, there's a radical cult of decolonization, but then there's also there was colonialism and you don't have to join a radical cult of decolonization to acknowledge, acknowledge the colonial. But what you do do ha have to do is to avoid the the uh, kind of cultish utopian thinking that all I have to do is invent a few really nice, clean, neat, pretty ideas and squeeze people through that box, and and human humanity gets better. It just doesn't work that way. But but uh, to, for me to conclude, I'm going to say uh, we need to get away from Gaussian perspective, the idea that we have a um, that humans are distributed around norms. Uh, that was a statistical convenience. It was very useful for developing operations systems and large organizations and so forth, but it's not really an accurate way to describe humans. We're more like a complex network upon complex networks upon complex networks upon complex networks. It's more of a network perspective, tangly, node to node, uh, rather than being this sort of like field of distribution of points around a mean and, and like, a, like a magnetic field or something. And it also means that most of who we are is based on the relationships that we've had and not so much um, some sort of ideal that we, platonic ideal that we failed to, we failed to match. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm much weirder and wilder than whatever biodeterministic metric anyone could ever put on me. And I think Person you are too. Personalities <laughs> are too diverse. I mean, my, my, uh, uh, look, I, I wasn't able to fit into the regular classic mold and I turned out well, I'm a professor now, but you know, like, uh, when, um, I spent most of my childhood in, um, permanent gifted, um, because uh, basically in my state, we had such a thing. So there were a small group of kids in the state of Delaware who were allowed to basically live in gifted as their primary educational um, method. And really what that was, was just self-directed learners were just saying you're an individualized learner. It, Daniel Schmachtenberger had the experience of being an individualized learner. And he and I both benefited greatly from it. When I had to go back to the, the normalcy model uh, when I gra graduated out of that gifted program, when I was in sixth, seventh grade, and it's like, okay, now you're back into the normalcy model. How did you feel? I immediately became very rebellious, very unhappy. All my pictures, I'm frowning as a child. And it was because basically I was losing the joy of learning and because I was expected to hit these numbers at these times in these places or else I'm a problem and I'm a social problem. I don't, I don't fit in with what everybody else is doing. And we can do better than that by personalizing learning, personalizing development. And that's the direction of things. That is exactly where we're going in education and in psychology. And I don't think anybody knows what's better right now. I mean, I would just like to say no. that given the, <laughs> given the history we're coming out of, it should be fairly obvious that a good deal of the, um, the premises, like I was saying, the premises of what we've based, the way you parent, the way you teach your kids mm -hmm. how to be in the world, how you, you know, the implications of you need to actually, that sanity is fitting into an insane world. That, exactly. And, and, you know, obviously this doesn't work anymore. So right. now, some the, good news is that we've all, the good news is that we're on, we're on, we're on a positive track. Mm -hmm. I personally believe that I'm seeing like Michael Garfield, for example, has mentioned that some recent psychological theories of development are improving. They're not based around normalities. They're more based around, I don't know, necessary conditions, which basically says from a pragmatic stance, uh, uh, you're an individual, uh, where are you going and how are you meeting the necessary conditions for that? That is not the same thing as here's this normal distribution. Right. 
we all we all are measured in our relation to that one distribution. Yeah, we should wind up. But mm -hmm. I guess, you know, the other thing for me is always because I, I work in this warm data world of yeah. how much transcontextual information was there in the research, because you are a transcontextual creature. And so am I. I, you know, the way that I'm learning and developing is not just what's visible and how I operate with geometry. Right. It, it, it's actually lots of people can't pass the geometry test, but they can feed their siblings or they can, you know, help a, 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 a somebody who's in need. And the exceptions are more common than the rule. Actually, right. So and I wanted to end on this because I wanted to end on the idea of that people keep coming back and saying, there's all this construct validity to these stage theories. And I say, great. What's your effect size? Uh, I've used this measure, this scale. I'm like, okay, as uh, Jordan Peterson has mentioned and other people have mentioned, the effect sizes on these things are very small, even though they are showing some sort of correlation. Mm. Say, oh yeah, I use this scale and it, it seems to show correlation. Be like, what's the size, 0 0.2, 0 0.3? Um, the reason why is that says that the exception is more common than the rule. So even if there is a pattern there, it may be that out of a population of 20 students, for five people, it works great. For five people, it works a little bit. And for the other 10, it doesn't work at all. And you're gonna get a 0.3 correlation, mm. you know, 0.4. And it's, it's not telling the true underlying structure of what's, what's under that data. And so a lot of, uh, for me, a big part of worn data is also data which is uh, accurate or to its original uh, a source rather than the data itself already being corrupted by a filter. So where you'd say, um, I took away the, the, the 20 children with the five, with mm. all the different right. subpopulations. I took all that all away and averaged. And, and, and so I'm not getting the right, uh, the explanation or the in interpretation I should draw from that data is now misleading. And that's the way research has been done right. for the last, you know, hundred years. And so and at a future time, I want to talk to you about exactly how that came into being, because there are some very specific people who made that the case, who said, this is how we do research. These are the tools that we use. This is why. And we could get into that in a future conversation. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> Meanwhile, thanks a lot. And um yeah, I'm sorry if I offended you. I kind of didn't mean to, um, but but at the same time, I you know I do stand by the the conviction that these types of theories are are planted in a dark dark soil, and um, they keep and they keep finding and, ways to resurface through things that we think are innocuous. Where we're like we're trying to do a good thing here. And it, and these these old things are rerouting. Yeah. So, so oh. all right, it was great talking, Nora. Thank uh, you so you much. You may, you guys Robert. may not, you guys may not believe it, but we just met and so <laughs> we communicate very well. So I'm enjoying it. It's been nice to get to know you. Yes. All right. Thanks a lot. I'm gonna right, stop the recording now.